<laughs> what is the difference between this and this? This is wadded up consciousness. I unwad my wadded up consciousness. Together? I unwad my wadded up consciousness. When you were a kid, you ever like put your foot on a hose? I was going to use a prop, but then I realized that everybody just be staring at the hose and I triple. <laughs> but if you ever just, you know, put your foot on the hose and then what happens when you take your foot off of it? It's fun. It's flow. The flow is fun. Together, the flow is fun. I am the inlet and the outflow of all of God. Together, I am the inlet and the outflow of all of God. And so that's what that is. It's the flow. And we unwater water up consciousness and it multiplies. You never see water up $20 bills, by the way. It's always that small consciousness that we hold ourselves in. But, you know, it's about joy. It's about cheerfulness. And... Charles Fillmore explained something that I never had heard before. You know, there's that famous quote from Paul that says, um, If you plant sparingly, you will harvest sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. So let each one give as they purpose in their heart, not grudgingly or out of obligation. For God loves a cheerful giver. And he said, God loveth a cheerful giver. The Greek word translated here is hilarion, which means hilarious. Whether we make a large or a small gift, let us give it with a largeness of cheer and joy, even of hilarity, remembering that God loveth a hilarious giver. And this Charles Fillmore quote speaks to the issue of the law of giving and receiving, which is what we're talking about today. And to that end, I want to invite... Our wonderful uh, uh, board members, Sheila and Lane, to come forward and start passing out $20 bills. Yeah, and it, it, you know, we always say change. I love it. Bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. Well, how about cash? I love it. Bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. Cash, I love it. Bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. And if that isn't too crass for you, um, the point of it is everybody take it because if you don't, you, you won't get to experience what we're trying to do today. And I know there's people that are going to have a hard time doing it. <laughs> but just do it anyway, out of sheer curiosity of what I'm about here. Now, how many of you experienced this before in this church? Raise your hand. So probably uh, half of the people, two-thirds of the people. This is called Reverse Tithe Sunday. And what happened was this. Fifteen years ago, I was new in a church. Um, and I was down at the grocery store. And there was, some, there was somebody in front of me in the line at the grocery store that was so slow. They were having such a hard time that, you know, in my total patience, I grabbed a People magazine. And it opened up to a page. And in that page, it talked about uh, a church, a very conservative church that had some kind of Old Testament thing where they gave money to people to give out to the community. And I don't remember, I think they gave everybody $10 or something. And it was in People Magazine. And I thought, oh, that's interesting, but that's not for me. And I put it away. That Sunday, one of the head ushers walked up to me with the same People Magazine. And she said, I was meditating. I saw this. And it came to me very strongly that I have to share this with you. I'm not attached to it. I have no desire for you to do anything with it. But you're supposed to. And I don't even think it fits us. But you're supposed to read it for some reason. And I marked the page. And I knew which page it was. And it opened up. And there it was about them giving out this money. And something to do with the Old Testament and the multiplication of good, but in a charitable way or something. Well, I thought, what is this about? I think, and I realized, you know, this isn't an accident, but it still didn't feel right. So I went into my meditation chamber, which was our walk-in hot tub, bathtub, and uh, as I was lying there in my bubbles, uh, practicing the presence, uh, it, you know how when you relax, stuff comes to you, and it came to me. Do this as a, a tithing exercise. You know, um, that church, as every church I've served but one, ties 10% of its income to those sources of spiritual good that have been feeding it. So every month, the board members get together and decide where we're going to give our tithe to. One out of every $10 in our church is given to every month, almost every month, the Silent Unity and Unity Worldwide Ministries. The Great Lakes Unity Region, which is uh, feeding our children's education with good materials. Um, Martha Creek's Healthy Congregations. And then we see if there's anywhere else we want to give it to. But once a year, the board stops all of that and makes the decision 
we're going to give it to the congregation to give the tithe on behalf of the, con of the church, of the whole congregation. So what you get to do, you know, I can sit up here and I will try to talk about the law of giving and receiving and how wonderful it is and the benefits that happen in people's lives when they practice it. But the truth is that it isn't the same thing as experiencing it. So each one of us gets the opportunity to experience the joy of the law of giving and receiving by practicing it. And so I'm going to ask you during this service, and I'm going to do something at the end of my talk, Ask yourself, where am I receiving my spiritual substance, my spiritual sustenance in my life right now, outside of this church? Because if you take this $20 bill and you give it back to this church in the offering basket, that's this church giving back to itself and there's no flow, there's no circulation. This is the law of giving and receiving. And, you know, they say giving is receiving, but the only part of that transaction we have conscious choice over is the giving part. And so we make a decision right now to give to those sources which are spiritually serving us. Now, I had a guy who did not understand this at all, and he was, he was kind of the guy who was a guinea. You know, every congregation's got the guy who was a guinea. This was about 15 years ago. Was our, that was that same Sunday that we started this in that church. And he came up to me, he says, I didn't take it. He said, I don't think it's right that you did that, etc., 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 and I'm just not going to do that. Okay, fine. The next year, one step up. He said, well, even though you told me not to, I put it in the offering basket. Didn't surprise me. That's fine. The next year, he said, I gave it to the cat shelter. Now, I talked about how we're giving it to our spiritual places where God is speaking to us. And if you think God is speaking through, to you through a cat, you need to call the Interfaith Counseling Center. <laughs> but if that's where he's at, great. You know, because it says right here, giving not out of obligation or guilt or out of coercion, but giving out of joy. And so that's where he was at the next year. The guy said, you know, this last week I went through a tough time and I remembered a little prayer that I learned in Sunday school when I was a kid in the Methodist church, this old farm town. And I looked online and I found that that church still existed. And I called him up and I found out, you know, the address and everything. And I took my $20 and I put it in the envelope. Actually, in that church in those days it was $10. I put it in the envelope and I sent it to them because I'd used that prayer that week. So there, so, and then he said, a couple weeks later, he said, I decided I'm going to start practicing the law of giving and receiving by tithing. And I'm going to start this. Now, it took him four years. How long is it going to take us? But you know, it doesn't matter because there is no time in God. Together, there is no time in God. And now is the time. Together, and now is the time. And now is always the time. And we're doing this so that you can get the experience of doing this Experiencing the joy, experiencing the pleasure of it, experiencing the flow of it. You're part of the flow. You get to experience it. It is such a powerful thing, and it's not separate from you. It's something that goes through you. Now imagine what life would be like if you did not have your foot on the hose, if there were no impediments, if you didn't have anxiety, if you didn't have a bunch of ego stuff going on, if you didn't need that recognition or have the hurt feelings or all that stuff. Just imagine what that's like, just for a moment. Take that moment and stretch it out, and that's called meditation. It's a powerful meditation. Take that meditation, stretch it out, and that's a way of life. And you say, well, that's just my imagination. But the truth is, is that you're just made up. You're a made up character in the mind of God. God thought you up. You're imagined. Yes, you are. And you imagine the states of your consciousness as well. So you can imagine your states of consciousness just as effectively and powerfully as God thought you up, and it's just as real. So, feel the flow. Feel the flow as you do this. You know, it's a powerful exercise. You're going to experience it. And, you know, uh, Betsy, uh, Betsy Nickerson shared this last year, or maybe it was the year before. And what she, what she uh, talked about was, uh, she's not here because she's experiencing her good in her life. And she's uh, off to Iceland in January, uh, looking at the Northern Lights. But what she shared was that she was sitting where you were maybe 20 years ago, and there was a guy named Terry who was uh, standing in front of the group and talking about his experience of tithing. And she thought to herself, I've been going to this church for years, and this guy's only been going a few weeks, and here he is standing up talking about that. 
I'm not going to let him get the better of me. And she started practicing it, and she was in the middle of a crisis, and everything started flowing, and she's never looked back, and it's never been anything other but joy and abundance. And I've shared before about churches that I've been in. Every single church, when I've gone in there, except for this one, was saying that they tithe, but they held back this, or put this in escrow, or put this over here, or whatever. This church... Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, B. And thank you, Board. Was tithing, so it was prospering. But every other church I walked into was in, was in terrible disarray. And I, I I like to tell the story about the church I walked into. My first, my second church. I asked them, are, are, "Are you tithing?" And they said, "Oh yeah, we are." And then I found out they weren't. But the whole board thought they were, and the whole congregation thought they were. But two of the board members were holding it for something else. And when that was confronted, and, and the way I found out was, I noticed that they were four months in debt. I was having to use my own credit card to buy the paper for the, for the bulletins. They were in terrible disarray. I thought, how could this be? And then I did some investigation and found it out. So after we let that go and started that flow, by the end of the week, they went from the red to the black, and within six weeks, they paid off four months' worth of debt. You know, and this has happened over and over again. And the only church that didn't prosper was the one that the board wouldn't tithe. So what does that mean for a congregation is we see God as our source, we practice it, we turn the money in the church not into a fear or a grasping or a holding on, but to a flow. We are the inlet and the outlet of God. I am the inlet and the outlet of God. Together, I am the inlet and the outlet of God. And when you let yourself experience that, you get to experience something wonderful. Your money turns into a prayer. Your finances stop being rooted in fear. You know, when Lynn and I came here in 2009, when the economy was absolutely as rock bottom, you know, my income went down before I was hired here to one tenth of what it was, and I had uh, somebody who I really trusted say, "You got to stop tithing." You know, you got a family. I said, "No, Lynn and I never even considered that." And we don't know how, but by the end of the year, we had more money than we started with. You know, it's just you're in the inflow and outlet of God, and you're. You're, you're moving, and it becomes a joy. And um, Andrea Jakubowski offered, uh, she called this week about something else, and I just, she told me a, a story about her experience of tithing, not knowing that this was the Sunday where we were going to do the reverse tithe. And so I said, could you tell that story to the congregation? So Andrea, can you come on up and, and share with the people what your experience was? My uh, first year coming here, I uh, took a 4T class, and uh, one of the uh, agreements was um, you had to tie 10%. And I thought, oh, 10%, that's a lot. And I thought, well, okay, uh, I'm in this class and I wanted to work. And at the time, I was uh, an executive secretary making really good money. So I thought, okay. So I started doing it, and then... Uh, uh, 2001, um, they were downscaling, and then a month later, 9-11 happened, and I couldn't get a job anywhere, so I was doing everything and anything, and uh, things were getting really bad for me, <laughs> sorry, but, um, you know, I think of ways of how to bring in more money, and it's, you know, it's like, God, help me, help me, how am I going to do this, and it never failed, no matter what happened. I would finally say, okay, God, I give up. Surprise me. Show me how you're going to do it. And that's when it would come true. I mean, and it was always for the exact amount of money that I needed. So, Well, a year and a half ago, um, I was in a car accident. And uh, it was a really bad accident. Fortunately, uh, God was looking out for us. Um, we were not, uh, there were no external, uh, internal or external injuries or major injuries, so uh, uh, the lawyer called us up and came and told us to come in, and I was praying for a certain amount of money. I thought, please, God, please, this would really help me if I got this amount of money. So he called us in, and it was for 10000 more than what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, usually on my tithe checks, I always put TYG, um, thank you, God. On uh, this one, I put TYGVM. Thank you, God, very much. <laughs> so, um, so, so that's my story. I mean, uh, there were times where I thought, you know, I, I don't, I don't really, I can't afford to give this ten percent. But I thought, no, God hasn't let me down yet. So, 
So that's my story. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I know how hard it is to stand up in front of people and do that. So I really acknowledge you for that. And you know, uh, there was a, Stratton Smith told me a story about a woman that really demonstrated the truth that we never know where our good is coming from. And you know, we just have to be open to it. And that's why when you're the inlet of God, you don't judge where it's coming from. And you don't judge the process. Um, it was his very first 4T class. There was a woman who was an assistant superintendent of schools who had a specific area of expertise in a suburban <coughs> school district of Sacramento, California. And, and after she made the commitment to begin tithing, she lost her job. The second week she showed up, she stands up in the testimonial time and shares, I lost my job. What's going on here? And he said, no, there's something going on here, but it's a movement of spirit. And so God is your source. You are the inlet and the outflow of God. And by the end of the 12 weeks, Five other smaller suburban uh, school districts hired her as a consultant in her particular area of expertise. By the end of the year, she was making three times the money. You know, Lynn had this experience, and although we came here under guidance for many, many different reasons, <coughs> one thing that looked really good to us was this was the only town or only city of all the places that we looked at where there were actually jobs for psychotherapists available. Lynn had just gotten her degree, and it, you know, with the economy the way it was and all, being self-employed really wasn't an option. She wanted him to have a, a, a nice, secure job and everything, and there were lots of them in this area. It's the only place in the country that had them. What we didn't know was that from the time that I said yes to the time that the moving van came, which was six weeks, the state of Illinois laid off 40,000 psychotherapists. Oh, so we showed up here and there was nothing or less than nothing, but there was a guy she talked to who uh, offered to mentor her for free to help her get her, get her, um, her, her license to, um, uh, gave, gave her the free use of his office on his days off. And all of these things started opening up and because she had no other choice, she had to go into practice for herself, which ended up being the best possible thing for a family with children in every way, financially and schedule and everything else. Because again, you don't know. But we were told, you know, oh, you're during this tough time, but you know, we just kept giving, we kept tithing, and it's a, an interesting thing that scientifically, people have found that there's something to this law. Arthur C. Brooks is a sociologist who wrote, in 1993, I was working on my book about giving, and I stumbled across a strange pattern in my data. Paradoxically, I found that donors ended up with more income after making their gifts. This was more than just correlation. I found solid scientific evidence that giving stimulated prosperity. Well, I viewed my results as implausible and filed them away. When I mentioned my weird findings to a colleague, though, he told me that they were fairly unsurprising. He told me that psychologists had long found that donating and even volunteering brought a host of benefits to those who gave. In one study, Harvard and University of British Columbia found that in terms of quantifying happiness, spending money on oneself barely moved the needle, but giving caused a significant increase. So if God loves a cheerful or hilarious giver, then it gives cheer in order when you give. Now Charles Fillmore was, was a great uh, uh, exemplar of this. I had a friend of mine who was a unity minister in Kansas City. And uh, he went to some big civic event and he met a guy named Ewing Kaufman. Have you ever heard of the Kaufman Foundation? It's one of the biggest philanthropic organizations in the country. But he identified, when he talked to my friend and said he was a unity minister, Charles Fillmore as his favorite customer of his very first job. Ewing Kaufman said, I was 19 years old, I was delivering laundry. And every time I'd stop at Unity headquarters and deliver Charles Fillmore's laundry, he'd tell me a joke. <laughs> Many of which were not appropriate coming from a religious <laughs> But he said, he said, even though I'm Jewish, he said, I, I, uh, I didn't come to any of the Unity services, but I, I read the literature, and he began the process of giving away his riches, and he was a joyous and wonderful man and a hilarious giver. You know, it's an incredible experience that's demonstrated time and time again when people are willing to let go, to get the foot off the hose, to unwind the water of consciousness, and to move forward with great faith. Now, you know, everybody is at a different level of consciousness. Everybody's in a different place. As it says in Paul, it should never be given out of 
guilt or coercion or manipulation. It's giving where you're at. But the tithing uh, principle is based in something that goes back in Hinduism to 3000 BC. It goes back in Judaism to Melchizedek, the king of Salem, which is now Jerusalem. Uh, and in Malachi, it says, Prove me now, says the Lord of hosts. Bring all your tithes into the storehouse so there'll be enough food in my temple. And if you do, I'll open up the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing that is so great that you won't even have enough room to take it in. Try it and let me prove it to you. You know, I've known so many people outside of the realm of churches who have shared this with me. You know, one gentleman, I remember I drove him around in the year 1978 around Kansas City in a speaking engagement. His name was Mark Victor Hansen. He's the co-writer with Jack Canfield of The Chicken Soup for the Soul. But he was... A, a, little, a guy who just drove around in a little Volkswagen, he didn't have any money, he only owned one suit. And he told me the story about the time that he uh, accidentally was trying to steam out the suit and it, and it fell into the bath water in his hotel room. And it, oh, just a lot of fun stories. But he told me something else. He said, I tie 10% to my spiritual sources and then I take another 10% and I invest it. Well, I saw him again a few years later. He still wasn't famous or whatever. But in between, um, he had spoken at a church that I served later, and he had lost. He'd become very wealthy, and then lost everything. And he said to his little group of fifteen people in that church, he was giving a seminar to, you know, I, I've, I've demonstrated this. I'm continuing to tithe, and I'm going to demonstrate it again. Well, something happened. His partner Jack Canfield gave a seminar on this little book from a little publisher, Chicken Soup for the Soul, that wasn't doing anything, uh, to a Unity Church in California. And there just happened to be a woman in that small crowd who was in charge of the National Education Association Continuing Education Program, and she made it the required reading, and 10,000 copies were sold in one week, which put it to the number one on the New York Times bestseller list, and he never looked back. And, and one of our board members who had been at that little tiny seminar where he was saying, I'm going to you know, manifest this, thought, said, I thought to myself, who's this guy kidding? This is never going to happen. And he had no idea how it was going to happen. But it happened in this incredible way. You don't know where your source is coming from. You don't know how the good is going to flow. But you just practice. And you do it in a way where you're not, you know, you're not attached to it. Things go up and down, to be sure. But you're always taken care of. You can always trust. I started tithing the last time because of uh, one of my ministerial school students. I started tithing when I was 13. And uh, I remember my parents went to a church that had a good minister, a good speaker, and then uh, I went to the church that had the Unitines group. And the Unitines group was really good, but the price of this was that I had to sit through a really boring talk by a really <laughs> boring minister. And the only way I could get through it is I went out to the free literature rack at the age of 13, and I'd find some unity literature, and I'd sit there, and I didn't know, but I was teaching myself how to meditate. And I'd sit and I'd read a few lines, and I'd kind of feel it, and then... And I was I'd get into this consciousness, and I could ignore that guy in the front. <laughs> so anyway, there finally there was one little pamphlet. It was called "As You Tithe, So You Prosper." We've got these out on the um, coffee table and right outside of Fellowship Hall. I highly recommend it. It's about oh, 40 pages, so it took me a few weeks to do this. After about six weeks, I would read this. It's by Ellie Meyer, and I thought at the end of this, you know, I think I'm going to start doing this. So I took the envelope in the pew in front of me, put a dime in it, because I got a dollar a week allowance, and I started tithing, and something incredible happened. I started to prosper more and more. I bought a brand new car at the age of 17. I was flying out all over the country. I was very prosperous, and my dad, and you know, I grew up in a family where there's healings that took place. My sister was born with birth defects, a lot of wonderful things, but they always struggled financially. So my dad came to me, and he was a little hurt. He said, how come you could buy a brand new car, and, and, and you, try, you fly all over the place, and I can't? And in my 17-year-old humility, I said, because I tied that, and you don't. Well, my mom heard me tell that story, and she said, you tell people, you got my permission, that he wanted to do it, but I wouldn't let him. And so, you know, we made it through life, but I, I had to unlearn that poverty consciousness, that lack consciousness that had been holding me back, uh, that would have held me back, that held my family back in, in my life. And this pamphlet is what did it for me, which really opened the door. But I, then I found out years later, I met Catherine Ponder. 
how many of you read books by Catherine Ponder, the, the great unity minister and prosperity teacher? She was so broke at one point in her life that she uh, couldn't, didn't feel she could afford the 10 cent uh, uh, pamphlets that Unity offered and, and sent away for the only one that was free, which was this one. And she read it, and it took her six months to practice and to go through this and to do all that. And she finally began the process of tithing, and she built her consciousness, same pamphlet. And it's written in the kind of archaic language, but the principles are good. So what I want you to do is to, regardless of how, wherever you're at with this, you know, just ask, where in my life am I being fed spiritually? And I'm going to ask you to just take your $20 bill, put it in your hands, and just ask, in your heart of hearts, where in my life am I being fed spiritually? But first, see yourself as the inlet and the outflow of God. Perhaps imagine that light coming down from above, and showering out, radiating out from your heart. And then just ask, if I knew where my spiritual good, other than this church, has been coming to me, where would that be? And just get into a little moment of quiet and listen. And now just trust and let it be and know that you've received it, whether you're conscious of it or not. And in the next week or so, you will give this gift as a tithe on behalf of this whole congregation and experience the joy of the law of giving and receiving. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And so it is. Amen. And now we take a deep breath and we let it out. And we open our hands and let go of all pieces of paper so we can be present in this moment. Take another deep breath and move into the consciousness of being the inlet and the outflow of all that is God. I am the inlet and the outflow of all that is God. Silently take that as your heartfelt thought. I am the inlet and the outflow of all that is God. I take my foot off the hose and I let it flow. I unwad my wadded up consciousness and I let it out. And first I begin by feeling myself as that inlet. What does it feel like to receive? What does it feel like to be a cheerful receiver open and receptive to the flow of the universal good. All of God's substance is flowing into me now. I absorb and I relax in my receptivity. I am the inflow of God. And now I imagine what it would be like if there were no impediments, nothing in the way for the flow to flow through me. I am the outflow into the universe of all that is God. As the inlet and the outflow of God, I experience healing in every atom and cell of my body. As I feel the flow now, I imagine what it would be like if I had nothing standing in the way of it. That powerful, mighty flow coming into my beingness and then flowing out through my heart. Maybe I can visualize a powerful light coming down from above, entering my head and then moving out through my heart into the world all around. I am the inflow and the outflow of all the good that is God. And if there are people in my world that need some of this directed spiritual substance, I direct it towards them. I am the inflow 
and the outflow of all that is God. And I imagine my heart showering, radiating upon them all this good. There are conditions in my life, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual conditions. I let myself experience the inflow. Divine energy now flows forth from my heart to each and every heart, each and every condition in my world. And I move into a deeper silence and I imagine if I had nothing standing in the way, what would it feel like to be the inlet and the outflow of all of God in the silence? As we move with this, as we flow with this energy, we experience healing ourselves. We experience abundance of good and answered prayers. We experience the best possible outcomes, harmony in relationships. I am the inflow and the outflow of all of God. Thank you. With gratitude in my heart, I keep my heart open and I keep imagining what is it like for me to have nothing standing in the way, no personality stuff to stand in the way of this flow. I take my foot off the hose, I let it flow, and I feel this flow it gives me peace and joy. And so it is. And there's something I didn't do, I didn't finish a story. And somebody in the line is going to say, well, what happened after you were in ministerial school? You know, my income went down to one third. I'd gone through a divorce and I did my budget and I found out that I was 20% in arrears at the end of the month. There's no way I could make it. And then I had one of my teachers, uh, uh, Hypatia Hasbrook, who had been my YOU sponsor when I was a teenager. And she said, you ministerial school students, you're going to be ministers. You're going to be teaching the law, giving and receiving. And unless you're practicing it, you're a hypocrite. I thought, well, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. So that week I started tithing, although I figured, well, if I'm 20% in the hole, what's 30% doesn't make any difference. <laughs> so anyway, that week, and this is not this is something I've never heard before or since, two churches researched a deserving ministerial school student who could receive their church tithe for that month, and I received two churches worth paid off all my debts. And then for the next year, my income didn't go up, but I was in money left over at the end of the month. Now, we're going to be talking next week about directing our faith, and I began to work with that a year later, and then my income started increasing. But it was like the loaves and the fish, and that's the end of the story. <laughs> so, now, as you have your $20, we do not want to see you put it in the, in the offering today, but this is our time of offering. So I want you to, to, um, to, to bless that which you are giving, and know that you're giving it in gratitude. I give in the spirit of gratitude, and I receive in the spirit of gratitude. Together? I give in the spirit of gratitude, and I receive in the spirit of gratitude. And silently. And again aloud together. I give in the spirit of gratitude, and I receive in the spirit of gratitude. And so it is. Amen.